Committee on Homeland Security Subcommittee on Cybersecurity Infrastructure Protection will come to order. Without objection, the chair may recess at any point. The purpose of this hearing is to receive testimony from a panel of expert witnesses on securing operational technology, or OT, across critical infrastructure sectors with a specific focus on threats to the water sector. Without objection, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Fluger, is permitted to sit on the dais and ask questions to the witnesses. I now recognize myself for an opening statement. Thank you to our witnesses for being here today to discuss the importance of securing operational technology, or OT. OT systems are responsible for controlling the reliable delivery of lifeline functions across the United States, including clean water and electricity. It is a national imperative to secure the foundational technology and infrastructure that underpins our nation's most critical functions. During my tenure in this committee, we have made great strides to focus on CIS's efforts on securing OT, but given recent incidents, we must revisit this topic to, cons to consider how Congress may further refine and strengthen CIS's support to critical infrastructure owners and operators. In late 2023, we saw the latest nefarious cyber activity against OT devices in multiple sectors, including water and wastewater systems by Iranian-affiliated cyber actors. This malicious activity against Israeli programmable, programmable logic controllers, or PLCs, is unacceptable. I was glad to see Treasury Department see the Treasury Department announce sanctions for six Iranian government officials late last week. This is the first step to holding these bad actors fully accountable. Unfortunately, this exploitation was not isolated to one sector, underscoring the risks associated with critical infrastructure interdependencies. Owners and operators across all sectors must raise the level of security for OT systems. Important first steps include following CISA's guidance to change default passwords and disconnect OT systems from the internet. <laughs> but in my conversations with owners and operators across sectors, I learned that sometimes basic cyber hygiene principles for information technology or IT systems may not translate to OT systems. Many OT systems rely on legacy equipment that owners and operators may not have the capacity to secure in the same way as traditional IT. Given this, CISA must update traditional IT guidance to reflect the realities of OT systems. I look forward to hearing from our private sector experts today on how this translation can be most impactful. As the Sector, sector Risk Management Agency, or SRMA, for eight of the 16 critical infrastructure sectors, CISA should lead by example and prioritize OT personnel and resources internally. I look forward to working with the six other committees of jurisdiction to ensure the remaining SRMAs also prioritize OT personnel and resources. As we discuss roles and responsibilities today, I would like to highlight CIS's success as a partner with industry rather than a regulator. I hope my colleagues will join me in continuing to empower CISA as an S SRMA and also as the national coordinator for critical infrastructure security and resi resilience. I look forward to our witnesses' testimony in developing productive solutions to strengthen our nation's baseline security for the OT that underpins all aspects of American life. And now recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from California, Mr. Swalwell, for his opening statement. Uh, thank you. Uh, I thank the chairman for uh, stitching together, uh, you know, such an impeccable uh, panel of witnesses for an urgent and important uh, topic. You know, right now the United States uh, is involved in a number of different global conflicts uh, from aiding Ukraine uh, as it defends its own territorial integrity against Russia, uh, helping uh, Taiwan uh, as it prepares for the threat uh, of a Chinese invasion, uh, and of course, uh, working in the Middle East uh, to assist uh, Israel in, in defending itself uh, against terrorism and uh, the allies uh, of Hamas in the region who are targeting Israel, which includes Iran. Having such a presence like that uh, puts an even greater target on the back of the United States uh, and our infrastructure and makes us more and more vulnerable uh, to uh, a cyber attack or an attack on uh, particularly our water infrastructure. And we don't have to imagine what this could look like because uh, we are already seeing actors like China uh, and Iran uh, carry out and, and execute uh, these attacks. So. Uh, Today, we have an opportunity to really, you know, take a deep dive into what our water infrastructure looks like. I want to commend, as the chairman noted, uh, CISA's uh, director, Jen Easterly. Uh, last week, she testified 
uh, to another committee that CISA has observed a, quote, deeply concerning evolution in Chinese targeting of U.S. infrastructure, and that Chinese intrusions have already been eradicated across multiple sectors, including water. The FBI also announced last week that it had disrupted Volt Typhoon, and I want to thank the Bureau for their work there. It doesn't change the fact, though, that Chinese hackers, uh, you know, likely under the direction of President Xi, uh, will continue to target the United States. And China will leverage its significant cyber arsenal to undermine the efforts of the U.S. and others who are interested in helping Taiwan preserve its democracy against a violent attack. Since 2018, CISA has been warning about Russian hackers as well, targeting U.S. critical infrastructure, including the water, energy, nuclear, and aviation sectors. But China, Russia, and Iran, of course, are only the tip of the iceberg. In addition to those nations, you have uh, rogue uh, cyber actors who are capable uh, of targeting and disrupting our water infrastructure. So there's a lot that we can do from expanding the Cyber Century program to signing into legislation uh, that I have drafted, the Industrial Control System Cyber Security Training Act. President Biden and CISA are raising the bar on OT security, but we still are not as prepared and as resilient as we need to be. It's target-rich, resource-poor sectors like the water sector that remain particularly vulnerable to cyber attacks. So, Chairman, I, again, I would rather get to the witnesses here. I, I think you and I are in alignment about what we need to do and uh, just grateful that you've called us together as we face so many threats from so many places and want to make sure uh, that our locals are particularly uh, prepared. Thank you, Ranking Member Swalwell. Other members of the committee are reminded that opening statements may be submitted for the record. I am pleased to have these witnesses before us today to discuss this very important topic. I ask that our witnesses please rise and raise their right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give before the Committee on Homeland Security of the United States House of Representatives will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Let the record reflect that the witnesses have all answered in the affirmative. Thank you. Please be seated. I'd now like to formally introduce our witnesses. Robert Lee is Chief Executive Officer and co-founder of Dragos, a global technology leader in cybersecurity for OT. Mr. Lee also serves on the Department of Energy's Electricity Advisory Committee, is a member of the World Economic Forum's subcommittees on cyber resilience for the oil and gas and electricity communities. He began his work in OT as a U.S. Air Force Cyber Warfare Operations Officer tasked to the National Security Agency. Throughout his career, he has supported analysis of some of the most significant cyber attacks on industrial infrastructure, including the 2021 Colonial Pipeline ransomware attack. Dr. Clancy, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer for MITRE and heads MITRE's labs. MITRE operates six federally funded research and development centers for the U.S. government and provides agencies like CISA with deep technical capabilities. Dr. Clancy also sits on several boards and executive committees on intelligence, systems engineering, telecommunications, and artificial intelligence. Previously, Dr. Clancy led Virginia Tech's research programs in defense and intelligence. He started his career at the National Security Agency with a focus on research and engineering for wireless communications. <clears throat> Dr. Morley is a manager of federal relations for the American Water Works Association. For 20 years, he has worked to advance security and preparedness in the water sector. He is also a Disaster Resilience Fellow for the National Institute of Standards and Technology, a member of the President's National Infrastructure Advisory Council, and a representative on the Water Sector Coordinating Council. Marty Edwards is Deputy Chief Technology Officer for OT and, and Internet of Things at Tenable. Mr. Edwards leads Tenable's role in, in the OT Cybersecurity Coalition and served as a working group lead for the National Security Tele Telecommunications Advisory Committee report to the President on IT-OT convergence. Prior to his time at Tenable, he held leadership roles at the International Society of Automation, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security's Industrial Control Systems Cyber Emergence Response Team, and the U.S. Department of Energy's Idaho National Laboratory. Thank you all for being here today. Mr. Lee, I now recognize you for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Chairman Garbarino, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify before you today. 
My name is Robert Lee, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of Dragos, a leading OT cybersecurity technology provider. Today, water utilities and other critical infrastructure organizations find themselves in the front lines defending against both state actors and criminal groups. They face growing threats, most importantly, into their OT or operational technology networks. These systems are the critical part of critical infrastructure. In 2018, I testified before Congress that Dragos tracked five state actors specifically focused on OT networks. Today, we track over 20 such groups, and my message has more urgency. My testimony focuses on three core points. First, there are fundamental differences between OT and IT networks. The biggest difference is the mission or business purpose of these systems. Generally, IT supports how you manage a business, where OT is the reason the business exists. They're the specialized computers and networks that interact with the physical world around us, including things like control pumps, chemical levels, and so forth at water treatment facilities. OT security is also unique from IT security. Most of our standards and regulations and best practices simply apply IT security controls to OT without considering whether or not they should be applied. This results in wasted resources and operational disruptions. OT security instead should focus on unique OT security controls and adopt from IT security only when it makes sense, such as those in the SANS Institute's ICS-5 critical controls. My second point is that cyber threat landscape for OT has shifted irreversibly. More standardized infrastructure has brought efficiencies, a homogenous infrastructure to manage, but it's also opened the door for reusable, scalable capabilities that can be used across sectors. In 2022, Dragos worked with our partners as well as closely with the United States government to identify and analyze a state actor capability or malicious software called PipeDream. It was the first reusable capability to cause the ability for disruptive as well as destructive capabilities across industrial equipment. This class of capabilities will increase the frequency of high consequence attacks we observe. There's a victory here as well. Dragos and his partners worked with federal agencies to report out to the broader infrastructure community prior to the capability being employed. It's one of the most significant public-private partnership wins of all time for OT security. My third point is that public and private sectors must work together to secure water security and water sector operational technology. For federal agencies, this means providing clear and consistent guidance to the industry that identifies specific requirements they need to support, such as realistic threat scenarios and opportunities to exercise them. When it comes to regulation, the government must harmonize across frameworks and use an outcome-based approach that defines why they are concerned, what the outcome is that we are driving towards, and leaves the how to the private sector. Or simply stated, give us the requirements, not the answers. Government resources also should not be directed to programs that replicate technologies and services already available in the private sector. A good example is the Department of Energy's cyber-informed engineering that operates in an area where there is no market and rethinks how we design the energy system to engineer out some of the cyber risk. The water sector resources need to be made available as well. As an example, at Dragos, we launched a program called the Community Defense Program which gives all US-based utilities with under 100 million in resources and under 100 million in annual revenue free access forever to our tech and resources. And yet, most water sites will never be able to take advantage of this. Even something as simple as a $3,000 one-time investment at water utilities for basic hardware and networking gear is almost impossible due to budget limitations and overly difficult spending approval processes that aren't informed by appropriate cybersecurity knowledge. Taxpayer-funded government assessments or further federal investments to develop the next great technology acutely miss the need. Small municipal water and wastewater facilities need direct resourcing. In conclusion, I have so much optimism that what we all can do together will work. We know what to do, oftentimes it's as simply as making it happen. However, a major shift must take place in order to solve the underlying economic issue that happens at our local water facilities. Together, we can figure out a way to make sure that those bad actors do not impact our local communities. I would very much love for my children to grow up in a world with safe water and electricity. Again, we know how to do it, but we must work together to get it done with an OT first mindset and all playing to our strengths. I sincerely thank the subcommittee for providing me the opportunity to testify today and welcome any questions or requests for additional information as we go on. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Lee. Dr. Clancy, I now recognize you for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Chairman Garbarino, Ranking Member Swabal, and committee members. Uh, my name is Charles Clancy. I'm a Senior Vice President at the MITRE Corporation, where I serve as Chief Technology Officer. It's my pleasure to address the committee today. Given the testimony last week in the House Select Committee on the CCP hearings from Directors Ray and Easterly and General Nakasone, um, I need not belabor the threat. 
Uh, suffice it to say that President Xi has tasked the PLA with being ready to invade Taiwan by 2027, and our intelligence community assesses that such an invasion would include widespread attacks against U.S. lifeline critical infrastructure sectors, including water. Uh, and this is not a hypothetical threat. We've seen through Volt Typhoon as an example that China is preparing for such an action. Software supply chains is one potential area of vulnerability, and the software bill of material, or SBOM, industry has matured significantly over the last couple years. Uh, one option is to create an SBOM clearinghouse for critical infrastructure sectors uh, that notifies both vendors and utilities when new vulnerabilities affect their products. Uh, such, uh, much like safety recalls in, in the automobile sector, it would prompt operators uh, to close security gaps in a more timely manner. Another area to improve is incident response, particularly in the water sector. Presidential policy directives 21 and 41 create the status quo that we operate under today, but they also silo our SRMAs from our incident responders within CISA and the FBI. Uh, by resourcing SRMAs to be more involved in incident response, they can better understand the current threat environment and bring much needed context to that incident response. Today's process is often open loop. Uh, we don't learn. Uh, the regulatory environment doesn't improve based on learnings we get from incidents, which runs counter to the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, reforms here can help close the loop for many sectors, including water. But if you agree with the intelligence assessments, we can't tackle the gravity of the threat we face uh, with policy reforms just around the edges. In three years, we'll still be negotiating the footnotes of a PPD-21 rewrite as our adversaries launch widespread destructive cyber attacks against our critical infrastructure. Um, today, as we view, uh, today, we view cyber attacks against our infrastructure as tactical, discrete events that we can identify, respond to, and recover from. Depending on the scope, scale, and impact of such attacks, we may respond proportionately, such as the uh, sanctions against Iran we saw last week. But this thinking does not scale to the strategic threat that we face. Instead, we must think of these attacks in the same veins as a major natural disaster, where the solution is not technology band-aids, but it's more about procedures and people. We need to plan, practice, and be prepared to act. Military systems have uh, what are called wartime reserve modes that change the configuration and operating posture uh, to confound adversary exploitation. And our critical infrastructure systems need an intellectually similar set of contingencies that can be activated in a period of major conflicts. Um, unless we prepare, train, and exercise for isolated operations where we literally pull the plug between our IT and OT systems, physically separating them from the internet, um, we really won't have much of an ability to defend ourselves. This dramatically limits our adversary's ability to activate destructive logic that's embedded in our systems uh, or to gain new accesses to our systems. Likely, many critical infrastructure operators lack the needed engineering staff to sustain uh, isolation operations in an ongoing capacity. Uh, so new programs are needed to train National Guard units or create a civilian core reserve of cyber-physical operators and experts to augment utilities to sustain such operations. Moreover, we need to practice for multiple sector failures in population centers and assess cascading impacts. Uh, this includes not only tabletop exercises and hypothetical wargaming, but also live drills where we test contingency operations. The cost of compliance is a common pushback for levying new responsibilities on public sector utility, public and private sector utilities. Uh, to offset, FEMA should extend their existing grants program in partnership with the SRMAs to fund necessary preparation, training, and exercises. Uh, CISA should be resourced to manage systematic exercise programs to ensure that we have the national experience necessary to act under uh, such urgent circumstances. There is considerable opportunity for EPA to step up, CISA and FBI to systematically engage across, and for industry to do better with information sharing. But these modest reforms must be measured against the scale of the threat that we face. With the limited time and resources available, we should early certainly begin piloting, exercising, and preparing for contingency scenarios that require isolated operations across our lifeline critical infrastructure sectors. I look forward to answering questions from the committee. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Clancy. Dr. Morley, I now recognize you for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Good morning, Chairman Gabarino, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the subcommittee. My name is Kevin Morley. I'm the Federal Relations Manager for the American Water Works Association, or AWWA. Established in 1881, AWWA provides solutions to improve public health, protect the environment, strengthen our economy, enhance our quality of life. In the modern era of utility operations, this mission also includes managing cybersecurity risks that could threaten the essential lifeline function that water professionals provide 24-7, 365. In terms of prioritizing cybersecurity in the water sector, 
AWWA has been at the forefront with our partners in building cybersecurity awareness and providing resources to support the implementation of best practices. Collaboration has been a core organizing principle. For example, AWWA worked closely with NIST, CISA, EPA, and subject matter experts from the water sector to develop a sector-specific approach to implementing the NIST cybersecurity framework as called for in Executive Order 13636. Our guidance and assessment tool, first issued in 2014, helps the utility identify and address the highest priority controls based on their application of various IT and OT systems. More recently in 2021, AWA assessed the potential for regulatory oversight options. Our recommended approach would create an independent non-federal entity to lead the development of minimum cybersecurity requirements, leveraging subject matter experts from the field, federal oversight, and approval of those requirements would be provided by EPA as the Sector Risk Management Agency. This collaboration uh, approach builds on a similar model used in the electric sector with congressional approval via FERC and NERC. Uh, in a maturing CISA, consistent public-private collaboration is essential. Recent examples of the benefits include filling the water sector liaison position in the Stakeholder Engagement Division, which has provided continuity of con communications and engagement engagement with the Sector Coordinating Council and the EPA. A recent stakeholder engagement process facilitated by the JCDC has generated a new water sector cyber incident response guide uh, informed by subject matter experts and the needs of utility owner operators. More recently, as noted in Director Easterly's testimony last week, threat hunting is obviously a critical value that CISA can provide to multiple critical infrastructure sectors. There continues to be significant opportunity to collaborate to support the cybersecurity needs of 50,000 community drinking water systems and nearly 16,000 wastewater systems, including the following. Unified messaging to launch a outreach campaign with partners to ex expedite enrollment in CIS's vulnerability scanning service to help utilities address, address threat exposure. Inform and enable utilities by investing in capacity development to empower utility owner operators to effectively engage cybersecurity issues that are aligned with their needs. We believe, for example, AWWA Small Systems Guidance provides a robust getting started guide focused on six key domains from the NIST cybersecurity framework. Training on the application of guidance delivered by trusted partners like AWWA is highly effective. It's been a proven force multiplier for building awareness and enabling utilities to assess potential vulnerabilities and implement controls to mitigate risk. Frankly, we do not need new resources. We need to organize those that we already have in place in a manner that is more accessible to owners and operators. Technology transformation, uh, as noted, uh, drinking water and wastewater utility operators have been evolving and adapting to new technologies since the turn of the last century. The difference today as it relates to cybersecurity is the convergence of technology systems that have traditionally operated independently. This integration of IT and OT systems has definitely improved operational efficiencies, but legacy OT systems were not designed to be connected. Many of these OT systems were major capital investments at the time of their uh, implementation with an expected service life of 20 to 25 years. The difficulty that we faced is that IT systems cycle through upgrades at a rate that has simply outpaced those OT systems. This digital divide has stranded many utilities on legacy OT systems. Funding that prioritizes and expedites technology upgrades to ad address legacy OT systems is necessary to overcome this digital divide. We must also ensure that those new technologies apply a secure by design principle as recommended by CISA. Improving threat information sharing also requires EPA and CISA to work collaboratively with the Water ISAC to establish standard operating procedures for the inclusion of SMEs to ensure that those advisories inform uh, information is transmitted in a concise, actionable, and properly contextualized manner. Uh, with that, sir, I appreciate the opportunity of the committee to share these points and welcome your questions. Thank you, Dr. Morley. <clears throat> Mr. Edwards, I now recognize you for five minutes to summarize your opening statement. Chairman Garbrino, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to testify on securing the industrial control systems that underpin our nation's water sector. I am Marty Edwards, Deputy Chief Technology Officer for Operational Technology and Internet of Things at Tenable, a leading cybersecurity exposure management company with 43,000 customers worldwide 
including just about every federal department and multiple critical infrastructure providers. In recent years, there has been an increase of successful cyber attacks against U.S. infrastructure, including the water sector. In November, attackers targeted the Municipal Water Authority of Aliquippa, Pennsylvania, exploiting OT assets that were directly accessible from the internet. Just last week, we learned of Chinese attempts to plant malware within U.S. critical infrastructure systems, including water treatment plants. Efforts to infiltrate the underlying systems that support not only the daily lives of Americans, but also the economy are emerging as an acute national security risk. We must accept that our national security defense requires securing all of the systems that keep U.S. water infrastructure operational. There is no doubt that the history of OT systems and the current challenge of IT, OT, and even IOT convergence makes securing our critical infrastructure more difficult. But we have the tools and resources to be successful. The federal government has several ongoing initiatives to improve critical infrastructure OT and IOT security, including for the water sector. I've outlined many of these in my written testimony. These are strong starting points, but they are insufficient to address the challenge. There is still significant opportunity for Congress to enhance critical infrastructure cyber preparedness. First, Congress should establish baseline cybersecurity requirements or standard of care for critical infrastructure based on effective cyber hygiene and preventative security practices. These should be developed in partnership with stakeholders and aligned with CIS's cross-sector cybersecurity performance goals the NIST cybersecurity framework, and international standards. Basic cyber hygiene for critical infrastructure operations includes continuous visibility into what assets are on your network, strong identity and access management, discovering and remediating known vulnerabilities, and implementing instant detection and response capabilities. These baseline requirements must also address the challenges of securing converged IT and OT um, systems. Second, Congress should prioritize robust cybersecurity funding for programs and initiatives aimed at improving cyber, uh, OT security. CISA's Cyber Hygiene Program provides a range of cybersecurity assessments to critical infrastructure and other organizations. However, it does not currently include assessments of OT and IOT systems. The program should be expanded and resourced to include these services. Congress should support CISA and the federal civilian executive branch agencies to implement cybersecurity policy recommendations like Binding Operational Directive 2301 and M2404. Protecting our nation's cybersecurity requires comprehensive knowledge of our networks, including conducting inventories of IT, OT, and IoT assets, and prioritizing risk reduction accordingly. CISA and the Office of the National Cyber Director should have adequate budgets to fulfill their missions and continue to break down silos. CISA must serve as an effective operational coordinator to strengthen security in these environments in real time. ONCD should serve as a strategic coordinator across government agencies. And lastly, cybersecurity should be incorporated into infrastructure funding. Modern infrastructure projects rely more on digital technologies and network connectivity so it is imperative that OT cybersecurity is addressed in all phases of federal infrastructure projects. Recipients should be allowed to allocate funds towards OT security, and any projects seeking funding should include a cybersecurity risk assessment. Thank you again, Chairman Garbarino, Ranking Member Swalwell, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify before you today on our nation's uh, the critical subject of securing the industrial control systems vital to our nation's water sector. I appreciate the work of this committee and the bipartisan support that is here for cybersecurity. I look forward to the ongoing collaboration to safeguard the IT, OT, and IoT systems that form the foundation of our nation's critical infrastructure, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you, Mr. Edwards. Members will be recognized by order of seniority for their five minutes of questioning. An additional round of questioning may be called after all members have been recognized. I now recognize my friend from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I was privy to a, a kind of informational kind of briefing uh, the other day uh, about uh, quantum computing. And the um, 
the CCP is, uh, is engaged in a Manhattan uh, project level effort to develop quantum computing. And, and so, you know, a lot of people don't know what, what that is, and I certainly didn't, but one of the things that struck me is that an example they gave me um, that a today's supercomputer uh, could be able to crack a certain code. It would take about 15,000 years for that supercomputer to crack the code. A quantum computer can do it in 30 seconds. So, and the, the CCP is actually kind of laser focused on developing quantum computers that will crack codes. So if that's the case, is any IT system safe, Mr. Lee? Yeah, thank you, sir, for the question. So I, I think this is absolutely the right question to start thinking about where the, the state is going. But when you look at the current state of our infrastructure, most of these water facilities, as an example, lack a firewall. So we talk about quantum computing and AI and similar, and you could just log into the system and change the water levels. So it's appropriate to think long term about that, but it's not actually the problem that we face today. And moreover, you absolutely can always do defense. It's just we have to actually start investing in it. Yeah, but would, wouldn't defense be the only defense at the end uh, when you're facing quantum computers, can, can crack any code, can get into any system? Wouldn't it be to go back to the future? Or in other words, go back? Uh, uh, where you have to disconnect and, and then have manual systems again, where where you know it's cracked and also whoop now we got now we have to manually start to do this and the switches and all that because it seems to me that if if you get into this realm and they actually can do that and you can crack any code in thirty seconds, ten seconds, et cetera, you can get into anything. Therefore, all of our systems that are actually tied into IT are super vulnerable or even will be super vulnerable. Mm -hmm. So shouldn't we be preparing for that today, not when it happens? We absolutely should be. We're just very far behind already. And additionally... No, but it seems, that, it seems that your solution is to get more integrated with IT. Oh, I, I'm more advocating the fact that the horse is out of the barn. Like, we are not going back to manual operations or disconnecting. It sounds great, but you can't operate a digital system that way at scale. Well, that's the problem. You're in a digital system. So you're, you're, you're leading to inevitable failure, ine inevitable defeat. Well, yes, sir. So I would argue, though, that the inability to operate the system in the first place would end up being more risky. So we actually can't go back to that way of operating. We don't have the staff physically possible to do that. And our vendors aren't providing anything that's not digital. And there's good reason for that. You want to be able to reduce the cost and operate the system. But ultimately, if we take the position that we have to do manual for everything, we won't be able to run the system. I'm not saying that you have to do it for everything, but you have to have a way to get back to manual if the system is completely compromised. So you're saying, okay, okay, what's it? We're done. All right, so the quantum computers are here. Everything's boop. We can, be, we can be compromised. They can shut us down anytime they want, and so we're done because we can't go back to a manual system. Uh, I would saying? actually argue that we, you're going to lose the battle of trying to prevent everything. But when you put humans in the loop to start doing detection, response, recovery, you can win. We've shown that over and over again. How? If you're all, if you're all dependent on IT. So as we're we, dependent on a digital world, and a di that digital world can be compromised at any time, how are you going to win that battle? You put humans, and you defend, and you allow them to be in defensible environments. So we've got plenty of case studies that never go to the public on state actors from China, Russia, Iran, et cetera, getting into systems, the A player teams, and well-resourced teams running circles around them. Defenders have an advantage. You're just not going to have an advantage on every single front. That's, that's today's reality with today's computers where you actually need people to, uh, to uh, infiltrate your system. In the future, with AI and quantum, you're not going to need people. The computers will be unleashed against us. And you don't have, I don't care how many people you have, you're not going to be able to defend it. The only way you can defend it is with your own quantum computer and your own AI. I think there's a lot of argument to be made of that, but a lot of that is theory. Ultimately, what we've seen consistently over and over again is well-resourced offenders beat well-resourced adversaries. I hope you're right, uh, but I also think that we have to, we've got to have a plan B, and the plan B is, hey, we may be able to need to turn that off and, and operate somewhat of a manual system, because if not, if they somehow defeat us, we're done. They can get our, they can get our, our electrical grid, they can get our water, our, our water supply, they can, they can run, ha you know, run havoc in, uh, with uh, transportation, they can do all kinds of things that uh, you know, can really disrupt our, our way of life. And with that, uh, my time is up and I yield back. The gentleman yields back. <clears throat> I would now recognize Carter from Louisiana for five minutes of questions.
Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member, thank you very much. Um, to the witnesses, thank you very much for being here for a timely discussion about something that's obviously critically important. Um, I represent Louisiana, and as you um, may know, we narrowly averted a real catastrophe with salt intrusion um, due to um, low water content and the issues with um, climate change. Um, how will federal agencies such as CISA collaborate with state and local authorities to implement proactive measures aimed at preventing and mitigating saltwater intrusion in vulnerable areas such as in my district in, in New Orleans? Uh, Dr. Morley, you want to take a crack at that? I turned it off. Uh, planning for alternative water supply is certainly a critical need, and the challenges that were faced in, in that portion of Louisiana were certainly uh, uh, challenging. Uh, I think it requires a collaborative approach between EPA, the Corps of Engineers, to some extent CISA, to evaluate some of those opportunities. Uh, the Water Sector Coordinating Council, for example, has made uh, wide scale uh, or regional scale uh, emergency water supply a critical priority. Uh, the challenge obviously is the scale, right? Moving, I think they were estimating barging. Well, we did water barging, we did right. reverse osmosis. We right. were fortunate that the weather changed That's and we right. got a little break and it wasn't as bad as it could be. But now given that we've had that test, um, what are we doing going forward? Because this was mother nature. This was climate. This was issues that were done by, by humans. Right. What happens if it were used in, in that capacity by a bad actor? Well, that, that's where the contingencies managing for the consequence, ind independent of cause, is I think some of the, the, uh, the challenge that we need to overcome and address some innovative opportunities to provide new and different uh, water sources. In light of climate change, what funding initiatives and federal resources are being proposed support long-term resilience and adaptation efforts in addressing saltwater intrusion within areas that are impacted. Anyone care to, to chime in? Um, Dr. Morta, thank you. Uh, Mr. Edwards, Mr. Lee, Mr. Dr. Clancy. I'm not sure on, on a specific funding program specifically targeted at, at saltwater intrusion, sir, but uh, programs like the State Lo Revolving Loan Fund and the WIFIA program are set up to help utilities uh, get low-cost loans to invest in new treatment technologies and alternative water. Have you guys looked at this, what happened in Louisiana, to, to use it as a case study to determine how we might address it in the future? I think that's an area for continued research and analysis on how to overcome such a large-scale type of incident. What, what partnerships and coordination efforts are being established between federal, state, and local stakeholders to ensure a cohesive and comprehensive approach in addressing saltwater intrusion how can these collaborations strengthen and be sustained effectively going forward? As, as my, my dear friend from Florida just said, we shouldn't wait until these things happen. Uh, in this case, it did happen. We saw what, what we narrowly averted of what could have been a major, major issue for my state in multiple parishes. Um, what are we learning from that and what are we doing? You four are notable experts in the area of, of water and infrastructure and critical infrastructure. Um, surely you've thought about this and there's some thoughts on what we can do. You're now sitting before this committee and we want to be able to arm you with the necessary tools that we don't wait until we have a catastrophe. Uh, you now have the opportunity to make an ask. What might that be to ensure that we're better prepared going forward? Mr. Lee? Yeah, I would add in that we need a consistent message from government. You go to different agencies and you'll hear different things, and we need requirements. Um, on the Department of Energy side of the House, on the advisory committee side, we talk about cyber resilience, cyber safety, climate change discussions, go down the, the list of it, and every time from the actual electric companies, we'll hear, we can do anything you want, just pick three and who's resourcing it. I think we need to standardize on what are actually the requirements and communicate with one single voice out to the asset owners. Okay. The, the administration, this administration has invested a great deal of money in uh, mitigating uh, lead and the issues with lead poisoning and lead in our water. Uh, how's that working and what can we do to further enhance that? Dr. Clancy. Uh, I'll uh, you can't take a nap in the middle of the course, man. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that is not my, my area of expertise. So Okay, fair sure. enough. Um, anybody else? Dr. Morley, 
Uh, Mr. Edwards? Uh, yeah, there, there has been a, a substantial amount of uh, funding made available directly uh, to support uh, lead service line replacement through e EPA. Uh, in addition, the agency is going through a, a regulatory uh, revision process on programs or, or uh, uh, regulations to protect the public from uh, lead exposure. My time has expired. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Gentleman yields back. I now recognize my friend from Mississippi, Mr. Zell, for five minutes of questioning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for being here today and discussing this very important matter. Um, considering the Iranian-backed cyber attacks on our country's water infrastructure recently, I'm glad to discuss today how CISA and the federal government can better understand these events and increase uh, its security measures. Uh, Dr. Morley, I understand that CISA has released their uh, cross-sector cyber performance goals. Do you believe these goals align with existing federal frameworks, and how can CISA further ensure coordination with other federal agencies? Yes, sir. So I am familiar with the cyber performance goals of the CPGs. Uh, they're derived from the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, and so I think some of the resources that we've already developed align with those principles. Um, I think it, it is a little bit of a, a branding shift from the NIST cybersecurity framework, which has created a little bit of confusion outside of Washington, D.C., but uh, I think we're prepared to continue moving forward and m have those all mapped together and, and uh, support utilities and other critical infrastructure systems in uh, addressing some of those performance goals. Thank you. Dr. Clancy, you raised a point about CISA needing to prioritize its efforts based on the specific risk and threat levels for each sector. For example, the water sector may face more risk based on a historic lack of investment and expertise. Uh, on the other hand, the energy sector is more prone to threats from our adversaries. Both of these seem uh, like pretty big threats to me. Uh, how do you believe CISA should navigate the balance between risk and threat considerations in the OT space? I think we every sector faces faces risk, right? I think some of the more resourced and more mature um, sectors have been able to better uh, manage that risk, but I think less resourced uh, sectors like the water sector um, have a significant accumulated risk uh, that because just they're, they're so fragmented, there's so many uh, individual water utilities um, and just a lack of, of cyber capacity across the whole ecosystem. Um, I think uh, where we see the adversaries focusing uh, are really these lifeline sectors. So CISA has prioritized uh, energy, water, uh, telecommunications, uh, transportation as sort of the four sectors that they think uh, are the sort of must survive sectors uh, with respect to critical infrastructure attacks. And so I think we need to continue to prioritize those sectors because without those sectors, many of the other sectors would see cascading failures. Can you expand on the level of risk and threat posed to OT systems as compared to IT systems? I think IT systems have been the, the primary target of adversaries for a long time. I think uh, Russia, China, and others, uh, in addition to criminal organizations, have been primarily focused on uh, either criminal enterprises or, or uh, espionage. But I think what we're seeing fundamentally different in the threat landscape is uh, Russia and China beginning to shift from uh, penetrating IT systems to uh, now starting to attack OT systems. And uh, the, the number of attacks that we're starting to see that are destructive really paint the picture that we're headed in a really bad direction in terms of fundamentally established international norms around what it means to cause a destructive cyber attack to critical infrastructure. Thank you. As CISA designates important entities, what kind of OT specific risk and threat considerations should these agencies be looking at? Uh, which agencies? The sector risk management agencies or yes. CISA? Yeah, I mean, I think we have a fairly comprehensive uh, set of frameworks in place, all starting with Executive Order 13636. Um, I think the, the challenge is less about having the right framework and infrastructure in place, and it's more about uh, the, the utilities being able to effectively implement uh, those frameworks. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's, a, it's a complex ecosystem and just the very limited IT staff, much less cybersecurity staff, uh, it just makes it impossible. Yeah, I'll tell you, you know, just 
each time we come to these hearings, uh, I get a little nervous and I get a little more confident. Uh, but I would like to express my uh, sincere, uh, whatever I can, effort I can put into this for you. Uh, you know, we cannot wait, we cannot uh, procrastinate. We have got to do everything within our power and you've got to get the information to us so we can make sure that we can cut through some of the red tape that continually surrounds uh, government uh, operations. So, uh, you know, please work with us as hard as you can so that we can make you be successful. We can protect this country. So uh, with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize Mr. Swalwell, the ranking member, for five minutes of questioning. Great, uh, thank you. Mr. Morley, is there any sort of like scoring system as far as vulnerability uh, that water agencies could have? And I'm of two minds of this. I mean, you don't really wanna put out there who's the most vulnerable, but you can also almost, I don't wanna say publicly shame, but you know, call out the most vulnerable to try and you know, get them uh, you know, to update their systems. You know, Mr. Edwards pointed out, you know, a, a recent attack occurred on a system, you know, via the internet. Um, so like, is that out there? Like, is there more that the private sector can do uh, or trade associations can do to just make sure everyone is, you know, at a high standard? Sure, appreciate the question. Uh, give it a shot here. There's not a scoring system. I think the the complexity and diversity of the sector makes that quite challenging. Um, and where I was leading in, in some of my testimony was, I think this requires, it's a shared responsibility, right? There's, there's excellent uh, knowledge and information available from agencies like CISA on, on the threats, folks like MITRE and, and others at the table that inform that process. Getting it into the hands of a utility to actualize it and take action on it, that's where we need greater investment in capacity development and uh, leveraging trusted partners like AWWA and others in the sector to work in the field with utilities to actually implement these controls, right? There's a capacity issue. You know, the, the workforce challenges that we have, you know, the skill sets are, are excellent at treatment of water. They're not cybersecurity as those like yeah. the gentlemen's surrounding me. So that's where I think there's great opportunity to improve our shared responsibility to protect. Uh, but I, I guess, are there like just across the board metrics that CISA could use or a trade association could use on, you know, multi-factor authentication, sure. uh, you know, level of training mm -hmm. for, you know, anyone, you know, who operates, you know, the systems, accessibility, uh, you know, the public has, you know, from, you know, the outside. I mean, I, I just wonder, like, Understood. is there more we could do to try and, as I said, just kind of bring everybody up to the highest standards. Well, I think that's where, I, I think Rob mentioned this, right? We need to define the outcome that we're trying to achieve and, and kind of unify around what that message is uh, and, and then put resources towards uh, enabling entities to achieve those outcomes. Great. Uh, Mr. Edwards, one key program at CISA to facilitate cooperation between the agency and critical infrastructure uh, is the Joint Cyber Defense Collaborative, uh, also known as JCDC. As part of an expansion of JCDC, CISA has established an ICS working group to focus on operational technology security issues. And I'm pleased to see that it has prioritized work in the water sector. As a member of JCDC, Tenable, would you agree that JCDC would benefit from a formalized structure and accountability? And, and what kind of results have you seen from its ICS work? And how would you like to see it build on its ICS work going forward? Uh, and, and I guess that, you know, the bigger question here is, does it need more scaffolding and structure and, and be less opaque so that people know how to get into JCDC and JCDC has an ability to also throw people out if they're not faithful, trusted partners? And is it a one-way relationship as far as uh, you sharing it sharing information with them, or do you feel like you're benefiting from what's coming to you? Yeah, thank you. It's a great question. Uh, I think from Tenable's perspective, there's no doubt that the JCDC provides some significant value. I think when CISA focuses on the operational aspects of information sharing, you know, uh, sharing information that's pertinent for a current threat or an emerging threat, and they have a 
sort of a, a finite uh, time window or, or activity around that, it really shines. You know, so, so we, we see great value there. I think as a, a constructive criticism, perhaps, some additional thought around how CISA incorporates other sort of what I would almost consider program offices into the JCDC construct, right? They, they tend to want to paint everything with the JCDC brand, uh, and quite frankly, I don't think that's as effective and it dilutes some of the operational successes that we've had. Uh, with regards to the industrial control system group uh, at the JCDC, uh, I think it's still uh, fairly young and, and needs some additional shepherding there. Um, but we're eager, I think, to continue to work uh, with CISA and all of our partners at the table to improve that entity. Great. Thank you. I yield back. The gentleman yields back. I now recognize myself for five minutes of questions. Um, it's funny, the ranking member has asked about uh, JCD, so that was going to be one of my questions. So, uh, and Sarah, you did a great job, I think, walking the line there. <laughs> Because uh, we've we've been we we talk about JCDC I think at every uh, every hearing we have and I know Mr. Lee your uh, Dragos is a, is also a member so I wouldn't mind hearing your opinion also on the question that the yeah I think I think Mr. Edwards asked. as you said did a good job walking the line Let, let's let's acknowledge that CISA consistently cares and is putting in the effort to try to collaborate like and that's a beautiful thing the reality is we're not seeing a lot of success out of it currently but I think that's the growing pains um, when government ends up focusing especially CISA on here's the strategy level. It's very effective. A lot of the messaging coming out from Director Easterly and similar is spot on. When he gets into the tactical and actually having the sort of the experts around the table, um, that tends to be a bit lacking. And uh, I think if they continue to invest in the strategic level and enable the group versus trying to be the players in the field, I think they'd see more success. Okay, great. I appreciate that. <clears throat> Dr. Morley, there are several legislative proposals floating around that offer alternative solutions to improving water sector cybersecurity, including a proposal for water sector regulatory model that is similar to the energy sector's model. However, we've heard from the energy sector stakeholders that some of their regulatory requirements are compliance-based rather than security-based, uh, and often take up to possibly 50% of an operator's time that can be spent on actual securing systems. In, in any future legislative solutions, how can Congress ensure operators are consulted in a way that prioritizes outcomes based security. Absolutely. So I think part of what we're trying to achieve with uh, the recommended approach that we've suggested uh, Congress take into consideration is to move to a, a, a risk and performance based approach that can scale uh, across the sector. So uh, the recommendation that, that we've suggested isn't just a, a lift in their XIP model and drop it onto the sector. I think there needs to be some recognition of the diversity and the complexity of the operations and uh, some of the controls, uh, as Representative Swallow noted, right, there are some baseline requirements that we need to establish and then allow that to scale uh, associated with the complexity of the system. Owners and operators in the field need to be directly involved in defining what those are because they understand those operational challenges uh, with uh, insight that can be provided by federal partners at EPA and CISA, for example. So when you think through the appropriations process, I mean, what's the best process then for us to legislatively fix this uh, or to make sure that operators uh, are included? I mean, is, this changes rather quickly, I think, with the you know, technology, as we heard before <laughs> by my, my colleague, Mr. Menes. This stuff is moving very quickly. So how do we, what is the, do you, what does the industry have a thought on what's the proper process to make sure the operators are at least successful when dealing with, with Congress? Yeah, I, I think the process that we're trying to uh, establish and what we've suggested sets uh, clearly defined objectives for what uh, performance would be in place to manage cybersecurity at a water utility system with some audit and oversight function to provide for that accountability. Oversight from EPA would, would be provided as a sector risk management agency and certainly information and other threat intelligence from other agencies, including CISA, would be informative to that process. Do you think EPA is the sector risk management agency right now? Yes, do you think they should be? Yes, do they sir. have the employees to, to be able to do it? This is why we think that there is a, a need to create an independent non-federal entity to leverage sector-specific 
knowledge of owners and operators to inform similar to what NERC does uh, to establish those uh, requirements and then uh, be in the field to do that. EPA does not have the staff to go out in the field and work with 50,000 community water systems. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Clancy, I understand that EPA is, again, we just talked about this, the SRMA for the water sector uh, with the mandate to carry out uh, with the mandate to carry out incident management responsibilities and facilitate technical assistance under the PPD-21. EPA also, with this in mind, EPA, uh, when the, as the administration rewrites PPD-21, PPD what should they consider when balancing responsibilities between CISA and each SMRA, especially when it comes to OT technology? I think the primary thing would be a more deliberate engagement of the SRMAs in the incident response process. Uh, they can bring uh, domain expertise and context. Uh, they can also learn from hands-on experience in the incident response process to better inform any regula regulations that they're developing uh, on the front end of the process. I appreciate that. I, I know we're going to have a second round of questions, so uh, I now, my time has expired, so I recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Menendez, for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you for bringing us together today. Thank you to the witnesses. In 2021, Congress passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, a historic investment in our nation's infrastructure that will help build and modernize our water system, transit networks, and broadband, among others. One struggle for much of our critical infrastructure is a reliance on decades-old operational technology that is hard to update and which does not have the security for today's threats. Mr. Edwards and Mr. Lee, how can CISA and other federal agencies help ensure that critical infrastructure investments build in stronger security, utilizing the latest secure by design practices? Yeah, I'll take a shot first. So thank you for the question. Sure. Um, you know, I think we've we talked earlier in, in our opening uh, testimony that there's, there's no doubt that all infrastructure now relies on digital equipment to function. And so I think that uh, I would emphasize we, we need to continue to fund that at all aspects of, of a project. So it's not just a once and done, right? This isn't a capital expenditure uh, like building a bridge or building a tank with water in it. This is an ongoing care and feeding that's required of these OT networks. Um, I'm pretty optimistic that if the uh, funding agencies or entities, be them state, local, tribal, territorial, or federal, um, follow things like CISA's uh, cyber performance goals as, as those minimum baseline requirements that we can get there. Uh, I think that long term, uh, some regulatory uh, capabilities are necessary to put the checks and balances in place, but we just need to make sure that from the get go, we're defining the cybersecurity objectives in the project and then uh, measuring them with, with uh, metrics and key performance indicators along the way. Appreciate that. And anything in the secure by design practices that you'd like to touch on? Yeah, I think that that's certainly a, an area of passion for me. Um, you know, many, many uh, entities, vendors, OEMs, et cetera, have built equipment over the years that uh, wasn't necessarily secure by design. And so I think having, uh, again, a minimum baseline kind of set of requirements that, that in order to be used in critical infrastructure, your equipment must meet the minimum requirements, right? You, you must change the default password upon, you know, first installation kind of thing. Then we would alleviate some of the challenges we've seen uh, recently with equipment directly connected to the internet with default passwords. So yes, I believe that this initiative by CISA has got some really good uh, opportunity and I'm happy to see that they're uh, structuring some of it specifically for OT and industrial control systems. Sure, Mr. Lee, anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I, I would agree with Mr. Edwards and add that it really goes back to the strategy of what do we actually care about. So we can talk about cyber hygiene, cyber resilience, all those cyber buzzwords all day long, but what are the scenarios we actually care about? You care about ransomware in an OT system, you care about targeted attacks like Pipe Dream we've seen before. You, there are certain things that have happened that we need to address. And right now, we oftentimes, especially from a government perspective, get into how to operate the system or how to change things. And the asset owners and operators are confused about what we're even trying to accomplish. So we need to get out of the weeds a little bit and go back to the why and what are we doing this and leave the expertise to the ones that are actually operating the infrastructure to accomplish that or said a little bit more punchy. There's a lot of folks that have never stepped foot at a pump station that are trying to tell people how to operate it. Let's figure out what are the scenarios and then let them go use their expertise to do it and we can do exactly what you're talking about. 
Sure. And how quickly are those different scenarios evolving in terms of this like threat landscape? On the OT side, not as not as much. We have high consequence attacks, but they're much less frequency in, in terms of IT. So in the water sector, there's probably three or four scenarios that we should really be guiding towards. And then there's flow down effect to a bunch of the other scenarios that may happen by the same security controls we're putting in place. But if we get out there and tell them to do 50 things, and most water utilities in this country share one IT contractor, let alone a full-time IT or security staff, it's just not going to work that way. Sure. Dr. Morley, how is the water sector in particular seeking to ensure investments in water infrastructure are built with security in mind? Well, uh, unlike many of the other sectors, uh, we have not had direct investment in supporting our technology transformation. And so that is something that we've advocated for. I think there are, there are opportunities within uh, America's Water Infrastructure Act of 2018 to authorize some uh, resources to address resilience of utilities, but they have not been appropriated to date. Got it. And with the last question, the EPA serves as the sector risk management agency for the water and wastewater sector, but has often struggled to have the resources and expertise to support the sector, making collaboration with CISA particularly important. For anyone that wants to answer, how can CISA and the EPA better coordinate to improve their support for the water sector? I guess I'll take a run at that. Sure. <laughs> Sitting with them with the sector coordinating council. I think it really, uh, it really necessitates a much more a collaborative approach that brings the stakeholders to the table to clearly identify the needs that we actually have so that the solution set uh, satisfies those requirements. Got it. And with that, I yield back. We're out of time. <laughs> the gentleman's time has expired. I now recognize my friend from Texas. Uh, happy he's here to wave on today, uh, Mr. Pfluger. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. appreciate you letting me wave on, and thanks for holding this. And Dr. Morley, good to see you again. I know you testified in front of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Uh, on this important subject, and Mr. Chairman, I'll say that uh, important to have both perspectives, you know, on, on the homeland side with the critical infrastructure, but also with the jurisdiction of, of ENC. I think this highlights why it's important to have members on, the, on those committees. Um, we held a hearing last week. Uh, it was clear uh, to me that any standard or government action has to be collaborative between the operators. Um, who know the issues, uh, and a one-size-fits-all approach is probably, you know, that's really what I took away from our hearing last week. So I'll start with Mr. Lee, um, and I'd like to, to hear from you. Can you highlight a, a few key uh, differences in the industrial cybersecurity community when it comes to different operational technologies? Yeah, thank you for the question, sir. And, and absolutely, when you look at the operational technology side of the house, a lot of those IT security things that we know as basics and smart things to do, or maybe not even the right emphasis. We talk about vulnerability management in IT. When we look at it from an intelligence perspective, it's something like two or three percent of the vulnerabilities that matter to operations technology at all. So a lot of the times we just put the wrong emphasis on what we're supposed to do in OT, and so we give out pages of guidance to folks that actually don't move the needle towards operational resilience. If you steal from IT, you steal somebody's data. You target OT, you kill people. You need to treat that differently. Across industries, what are the commonalities uh, that, that you're seeing? Across industries, the commonality is that the native functionality of those systems is important and needs to be protected, and it's also what the adversaries target. If I can open up a circuit breaker on an electric substation as an engineer, so can the adversary. If I can control a water station as an operator, so can the adversary. It's not just about exploiting the system, it's about knowing how to operate it. That part, that part is common. Then when it gets to the physical process and the purpose of the operations, that's where it gets more specific to industries. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll go to Dr. Morley now. In the energy and commerce hearing, uh, the need for a collaborative approach uh, was discussed. I think that was a bipartisan conversation and, and agreement across both sides of the aisle. We talked about the electricity sector uh, in that particular hearing, uh, which is an industry with significant risk. Um, can you talk to us about how, uh, in, on January 9th, DHS published a report highlighting uh, the, the, this need entitled, CISA needs to improve collaboration uh, to enhance cyber resiliency in the water and wastewater sector. Um, based on your hearing last week, this week as well, uh, how can CISA improve their coordination um, and communication with EPA, the water industry, and the cyber community? Yeah, I, I mean, they have made some substantial strides since that, the, 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 the focus period of that report, uh, first starting with actually having a sector liaison dedicated to the water sector, which we didn't really have for several years. So that's a, a significant improvement in the stakeholder engagement division. Uh, I think some of the uh, uh, current activities centered around 
Elevating uh, visibility on the vulnerability scanning service is a positive development, and we look forward to uh, working to elevate the profile on how those resources can support utilities with some of these capacity challenges. Thank you. We've got about a minute and a half left. Um, let's just go to uh, that, you know, most vulnerable situation. I want to go down the line. You know, what is the situation, um, the attack scenario, specifically dealing with water that keeps you guys up at night? Minute and a half, we'll do about 15 seconds, 20 seconds per. Yeah, I would say generally speaking, I care about things at scale. Local communities can kind of respond, but when you start looking at sophisticated capabilities that can be reused, and you start looking at destructive or disruptive operations, you can very quickly deny drinking water. I mean, I can't sit through this hearing without going through this water for you know 30 seconds, let alone two weeks. So denying access to our communities or even manipulating chemical levels in that at scale is a scary scenario that we have to prepare for. Thank you, Dr. Clancy. Uh, I'm particularly concerned about the interdependencies between several of the different critical infrastructure sectors. Uh, you hit energy, water goes down shortly thereafter. Same thing with natural gas, right? So they're, they're all interlinked. Uh, and if you have a significant attack on one, you can cause cascading of failures in others. Great point. Dr. Morley? Yeah, I would uh, signal the, the similar concern with cascading implications for degradation of uh, drinking water or wastewater services and, and the consequences within the community for that service being unavailable. Okay, lastly, Mr. Edwards. Yeah, I think echoing the previous uh, witnesses, the, you know, the, the reuse or the common use of, of some of these OT devices, the programmable logic controllers, is across many, many sectors, right? So you have the same box in a water uh, treatment plant that you do in an electrical substation that you do in a manufacturing plant. So kind of my nightmare scenario is uh, some type of uh, malware or ransomware that holds all of those devices hostage or makes them inoperable, and we just simply do not have the supply chain capacity to replace all of them in any uh, reasonable amount of time. Yep. Thank you, Mr. Uh, for all of your, the witnesses being here. Chairman, I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. Thank you very much for, for coming. Um, I now recognize Ms. Lee from Florida for your first round of questions, right? Yes, wonderful. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to all of our witnesses for joining us here today. Uh, it really helps us to hear your insight uh, and perspective. One thing that I'm interested in is CISA, uh, you know, who, as, as you all know, offers a lot of voluntary cybersecurity tools and assessments and ways uh, that they can help critical infrastructure entities, uh, but not all organizations really have a lot of visibility or awareness of these tools and how they can be useful. So I'm interested, um, you know, Dr. Morley, maybe we start with you. Uh, in your view, what can CISA do to make sure that the entities who, who can avail themselves of these tools and supports know that they exist uh, and actually engage and utilize them? Sure, I, I think uh, we've started some of those conversations and I think what's really important is, again, the diversity and the complexity and capacity of, of the systems within the water sector uh, really requires us to organize the resources in a manner that's more accessible. Some of the resources that are there now, you know, it's one line, you don't know what it is. If you're not a cyber expert, you're not gonna sign up for it. So I think a more collaborative effort with stakeholders to define different entry points into those resources Right, so it, it scales to what their need is, and then they pro progress within a maturity model would be very effective. And do any of the other witnesses have something to add on that particular subject? I would just say that, again, at a strategy level, is doing an amazing job. Mm -hmm. but when you're talking about a lot of these services, many of them are done more efficiently in the private sector, and if there was more direct resourcing to the local communities and the water companies that actually deal with their local integrators, the local contractors, et cetera, you would not only achieve more efficiency, but then you wouldn't have to worry about trying to make awareness available to 50,000 people, or 50,000 entities. They would know who to reach out to, and you would create jobs and resources in the local communities as a result. And on that subject, I'm also interested in your experiences working with the regional offices. It sounds like taking it, some of that national and making it more local-based and regional-based would be effective. What is your experience working with those regional offices? Uh, it tends to be a wide variety of skill sets. Um, so as an example, where CISA can have more of the general strategy in cybersecurity, I would look for the regionals to be much more aware of their local sites, much more aware of how those operations work. Um, and region by region, it's just resourced so differently that it's, it's disparate. 
And Dr. Clancy, what is what is your experience or perspective on the on that subject? I think there's something like 180,000 water utilities. You probably know the number, something like that, right? So I, there's just so many of them, and, and many of them are tiny, and they just don't have, so you talk about uh, the ability to apply for some CISA program, it's not even remotely on their radar, right? They're just trying to keep <laughs> their one tiny pumping station running. And so I think the larger, better resourced uh, organizations are the ones that have the capacity to even engage in these programs, and they're perhaps the ones that don't need as much help. So I think that's the asymmetry we have. And, and what would be your thoughts on how we get these programs and supports down to those smaller ones who, uh, you know, I understand often in, in other sectors too, other critical infrastructure sectors often are the ones that need the help the most? I think there's a couple different approaches. Certainly Rob's suggestion that we uh, better engage the private sector who is providing much of the support to them already uh, would be one avenue. I think there's also um, uh, sort of these mentorship type programs where you can have the larger operators be resourced to work more closely with the smaller uh, uh, operators within their communities as a way to, to work across. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Gentlelady yields back. Uh, we're not gonna do a second round of questions for members who want to. Uh, I now recognize the gentleman for, from Florida, Mr. Jimenez, for a second round of five minutes of questions. Thank you. I hate to go back to, to uh, what my premise was in the, in the, in the beginning, but I, I'm going to. Um, you know, what have I told you that, that we rely on a lot of, of systems that use GPS and that now GPS is becoming less and less, um, well, it's almost becoming useless to the point that's being jammed. So now we have to go back in time again to other systems to for our weapon systems like inertial navigation and magnetic navigation. And so my, you know, my, my first round was, hey, you've got this threat coming, it's called uh, quantum computing, attached to AI, it's going to make all your efforts, it could make all your efforts fruitless. And so, you know, I was thinking about, okay, you know, do we go back to manual? And I, and I, and I touched on that, but instead of relying on the internet, wouldn't it be, smarter for us to rely more on intranet, to, to have those, those systems that are vital to us, unplug them from the internet so they can't be attacked from the outside, it's just a closed loop. They can have all the efficiencies of, a, of um, you know, uh, IT or, or, or operational technology, et cetera, but they can't be attacked from the outside because it's a closed loop. And what if I were to tell you that the Chinese are already doing that? that uh, they have established a vast network of intranet, not internet, it's not connected to anything. They're only connected to each other, that's it. Uh, you can't get to it from the outside. Would that make sense to protect our vital infrastructure like energy, like you said, energy, if they attack our energy sector, they will eventually get to everything else because our water systems run on energy, all that. So would it make sense for the United States to start investing in, in, in an intranet of uh, vital, um, vital operating systems. Uh, so, sir, I would, I would generally say that I very much prefer the American infrastructure services provided than the ones the Chinese provide to their citizens. And it's because of that that we have digitization and connectivity. You can't, you can't go back. But to your point, I think it's spot on for what are our strategic sites? What are the ones that we want to be able to have that capability? Because to do it at scale across the 50,000 plus water companies cannot be resourced, especially when we're still dealing with the trillion dollars worth of infrastructure upgrades we just need for clean water. So, But, but sir, you're, I'm giving you Murphy's Law, and you're denying it. You're uh -huh. saying, it's okay, well, you know, I mean, we, we resource it, which means to me you need more people, you need more money. What if I to tell, were to tell you that for every one person that we have working on the Chinese issue or the CCP, they have 50. Mm -hmm. You'll never be able to out-resource them, okay? So yes, shouldn't we develop walls that are really hard to penetrate? If we are still, we're, if you're somehow attached to the internet, you are bound to fail. We are bound to fail. Y so, yes, sir. Go ahead. I, I'm an Air Force and NSA alum, sir. I would take one of ours for 50 of theirs any day. But to your point, when you look at these systems, if we pick out the strategic sites and do a lot of what you're talking about, I think it's a great idea. We just cannot scale it across the entirety of the country, especially when a lot of water infrastructure companies share one IT contractor amongst six companies. You're talking about 20 more engineers per company. It's not in the resourcing capabilities of our country. 
But to pick up the strategic sites, I think you're spot on. And it also goes back to what the Department of Energy is doing with the cyber-informed engineering. Here's key sites on like a crank path to restore the electric system if it goes down. Let's make sure those have the ability to do that. That makes a lot of sense. No, what I'm, what I'm saying, look, the vulnerability comes from the fact you're, you're tied to the internet. Anybody can attack you from anywhere in the world. If you have a closed system, in Tronnet, they can't attack you from anywhere in the world because you're a closed system. And we could not operate it. And you what? And we could not operate it. When you look at the operation portfolio, when you look at the OEMs, the original equipment manufacturers, and how they build these systems and how we work with them, you can no longer operate manually disconnected or in an intranet. And unfortunately, that's just a reality. We have to accept it at a technical level. So then it's risk management beyond that about what do we do about it. Should we develop that capability? I think there are more efficient ways to get to a more resilient system than trying to do that. Again, I, I guess I'm a little bit more pessimistic uh, knowing what's coming. Uh, and uh, I think we should be investing in a ways to, to defeat what's coming, not what's here, what's coming. Uh, because at the end, if, if what I'm hearing is true, you won't be able to defeat it. Um, the quantum computing attached, attached to AI will be able to penetrate any system anytime. Uh, and so, okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. I'll yield back. Gentleman yields back. He's still fired up today. I like it. Just, but someone's going to give me a, some nightmares, some of these things, doomsday scenarios you're talking about. Uh, I now recognize um, Mr. Menendez from New Jersey for a second round of questions. Or, Thank you, Chairman. Yep. As part of the Biden administration's efforts to strengthen OTICS cybersecurity, the launch a series of sector-specific sprints, including for the water sector, reflecting the administration's desire to make OT cybersecurity a priority and better defend critical infrastructure from our adversaries. To any of the witnesses, what results did you see from these efforts? Uh, so I think I think in terms of the water sector and that sprint, I think some some of the resources and focus was on uh, some very specific technology solutions that uh, honestly were were a bit beyond the reach of many utilities in terms of maturity. Uh, but there are uh, important uh, awareness activities that have evolved from that, such as focusing on some of the more fundamentals like vulnerability scanning services that would address some of the vulnerabilities that we've seen exposed in water utilities recently. And how can the federal government ensure that such sprints turn into sustained actions in the future? Yeah, I would say it goes back to the direct resourcing of those infrastructure providers. And I think, you know, this goes back to the previous question. When we looked at the electric sector, that same kind of initiative was go out and do whatever you think is best. And you already have the capabilities and the rate structure to be able to get the resources to go do this. When it got to the water sector, they were pushed very strongly to a government-specific answer that didn't actually meet a lot of what they were trying to accomplish with no resourcing behind it. So more optionality and expertise from the asset owners and operators with more direct lines of resourcing, and you can achieve those outcomes. Good. Appropriators are currently working to negotiate a final fiscal year 2024 appropriations package. Fortunately, last year, the House rejected an effort by some Republicans to cut CISA's budget by 25%. And I am hopeful that appropriators will reach an agreement that adequately funds CISA's needs, including with regard to OT security. To any of the witnesses, how important is adequate CISA funding to maintaining its support for OT security and the water sector? Yeah, I can take that one. And um, a little bit of my previous role as director of the Industrial Control System CERT, which is now part of CISA, you know, I think that, that appropriate level of funding is, is imperative in, in this area. You know, cyber, the threat landscape continues to expand at unbelievable rates, and we must scale our defensive postures accordingly. So uh, I think it's very uh, easy within, within CISA sometimes to, uh, uh, you know, uh, I guess, not fund an OT-specific initiative if they have another compelling initiative to secure the IT systems in the federal government, for example. Those are very tough decisions, and uh, continuing to expand uh, to the appropriate levels of funding would alleviate some of those challenges. Decision making that they have to do in terms of looking at Absolutely. priorities and being able to fully implement a cohesive strategy, comprehensive strategy that, that takes care of both of IT and OT. Absolutely, I think that, I think that CISA needs to uh, have a lot more external um, advertising, for lack of a better term, to the uh, initiatives that they have existing in OT and, and essentially 
bring that into a cohesive series of programs rather than they continue to kind of reorganize and move them around, right? And, and some of that is as a result of having to deal with funding uh, shortfalls. Sure, and just picking up off of that because you're sort of alluding to prioritizing, what programs are most in need of strong funding in the coming fiscal year, in your opinion? Oh, wow. Uh, CISA has a very broad remit. Sure. And uh, this is a, a hearing on operational technology security, uh, and it's also a passion of mine. So I think that anything to do with industrial control system, critical infrastructure, should be right at the top of that, that pile. Appreciate that. Uh, and with that, since I do have time, I yield back. <clears throat> Gentleman yields back. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes questions uh, for the second round. Dr. Clancy, we've learned that a common hurdle in securing OT is having the personal personnel necessary to prioritize and implement guidance. Small and medium organizations at, and the federal government alike face challenges in hiring and retaining cybersecurity personnel. Um, but all in every set, in every part of it, but specifically amongst uh, OT experts. How can CISA help build baseline OT expertise internally and at each sector risk management agency? Yeah, zooming out to the macro perspective, we have a huge cybersecurity workforce gap in the country. Um, I think something like 37% of cyber vacancies nationwide are unfilled. There's, I think, 300,000 empty cyber jobs because we just don't have the cyber workforce capacity writ large across the, 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 across the, the country. Um, this becomes even more challenging for small sec small utilities for the federal government where um, their, their salaries just aren't competitive enough to attract and retain uh, any of the top cyber talent. Um, so I think there needs to be broad efforts to just, one, on the front end, increase the supply of cybersecurity talent into the broader workforce so that you have the capacity necessary to even fill some of these jobs. Um, and then you need to find ways to, uh, first of all, there's, there's very few university programs that have any focus on OT, uh, particularly uh, industrial control systems that just does not exist in current university curriculum. Um, I think um, NSA's Center for Academic Excellence program, for example, could be expanded. It's something they operate currently jointly with DHS uh, to include an OT cybersecurity focus and be able to really broaden university curriculum in this area. That would help, I think, with the front end capacity. Um, and I know there's probably lots of things we could do on the back end to, to retain them in those jobs as well, but a lot of that comes down to compensation and, and, and other things. I appreciate it. And if you, actually, we are working, we're going to be working on some workforce legislation. So if any of you have, you know, detailed thoughts and ideas, uh, uh, please share them with the committee staff because this is something we are going to try to move uh, before the end of Congress this, uh, this session. Um, Mr. Lee, I understand in... Some in industry have discussed potentially expanding CISA's secure by design guidance to include a secure by operation type of guidance for OT. How could something like this help OT vendors and operators? Yeah, I think again, the increased focus on this is the right area. Um, I would say that at a higher level kind of cross industry, it really needs to be based more on principles than specifics. But also we have a, a lot of ability to have a point of view and sometimes we don't have it. And what I mean by that, in terms of soft power, if CISA even came out and said, look, here's some basic requirements of the next generation PLC, or here's what we think good looks like, most asset owners would staple that to an RFP out to their vendors and it'd be in the market tomorrow. The problem is then though that CISA gets an angry letter from a, a, a vendor, some lawyer gets involved and they back off. So we gotta empower them to have points of view on national security and be protected from perception to be able to do what you're looking for. I appreciate that answer. That's uh... Actually, a great idea. <laughs> um, last, oh, uh, expanding on my JCDC question earlier, I sent a letter last year to ask CISA for details about how the JCDC will coordinate with similar information sharing efforts in the private sector like the ARC and similar efforts in the federal government like ETAC at uh, DOE. It is important that whatever the structure is, OT should be a priority. This is for both Mr. Lee and Mr. Edwards, since you're both uh, members of, of the JCDC. As CISA continues to refine the structure of the JCDC, do you think that they should organize these spokes on a sector-by-sector -sector basis or by IT versus OT or something else? 
Yeah, I would, I would take first shot and say that there needs to be the IT versus OT separation at the macro level, which they have done. There is an ICS or OT specific JCDC, but then in that spoke aspect, it's, it's spot on. If you look at the ETAC as an example, it's a very promising model, but it really comes down to all these groups want to share information, but very few want to produce it. And so we have to have the experts in the room using the unique data sources of the government to produce the insights and then share versus waiting on the vendors to give them information and then echoing it out. Edwards? Yeah, I agree with my colleague. Um, I also would add that that uh, when it comes to to the um, separation of IT and OT, you know, I think we've talked many, many times uh, during this hearing that that convergence issue really we have to address both uh, simultaneously, right? You can't secure, you can no longer secure OT without securing your IT and vice versa. So although some focus groups I think are a great idea, I think it's also uh, beneficial to have that uh, cross-sector and cross-discipline, cross-domain um, uh, pollination, which I think that the JCDC is well constructed to do. I would also add that they should build those connections into other uh, information sharing programs. I think we have to continue to break these silos down. Thank you very much. All right. Unanimous I've, consent request, briefly. You see, okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I ask unanimous consent to insert into the record a question for the record from my colleague, uh, Mr. Garcia of Long Beach, a statement for the record from Open Policy, a joint statement for the record from the National Association of Clean Water Agencies and the Water Environment Federation, and a statement for the record from the Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies. That objection. Order. Yield back. Thank, the, uh, thank you for the valuable testimony and the members for their questions today. Members of the subcommittee may have some additional questions for witnesses, and we would ask the witnesses to respond to these in writing. Preserved to Committee Rule 7D, the hearing record will be held open for 10 days. Without objection, the subcommittee stands adjourned.